watch this video closely. If you're like most people, you'll see a backhoe digging a hole in the ground. Well, it, it definitely gives you more of a connection, you know, more of a connection to, you know, what we are made of and, and what, you know, what the potential we have with resources. But Ben Owen looks at dirt a little differently, especially when the dirt he's digging up is clay. What, what's the potential of that lump of clay and what can we do with it? And that, that's what makes it special. First thing I look for is you know, what kind of workability this, this clay can have. Um, you know, is it going to be really kind of short and not really want to stick together that well? But just, you know, just barely dampening the clay here, just what a little bit of you know, moisture we put into it. And you can see how it just wants to kind of be sticky, kind of glue itself together. And, and uh, I think those are some of the first qualities in making pottery is you want something that's going to, by the time you go through all the processing of making this into a clay body, whether you take and add, you know, another clay to it of a different color or a different property, uh, when you go to put it on the wheel and start shaping it uh, on the wheel, you want something that will hold together and not fall apart. To the untrained eye, clay is, well, just clay. It all looks the same, but it is not. And before Owen can work his magic, molding, working, and firing clay into functional pieces of pottery, he must find the right type of clay. This clay has to have a really good foundation, uh, having those properties of workability, uh, strength that will hold up to temperature in the, in the firing and the finishing of the work, and then being durable, whether it's served afternoon tea or uh, you know, enjoy a cup of coffee or just for whole water for flowers, for beauty. And in his studio in Seagrove, North Carolina, Ben Owen transforms soil into art. You could say clay runs through his family. Owen's forefathers came to the area from England in the late 1700s. They too were potters, molding and firing clay to create storage jars and other utilitarian pots and dishes for the early settlers. So we're kind of taking this material that we have on our land and, and other areas we can find it and try to make that creation. Owen's grandfather continued the tradition, but what brought all these folks to Seagrove? I think that's what makes it wonderful is finding these materials. It's, it's like a journey. Well, finding the right materials to begin the journey of turning clay into craft isn't easy. Clay minerals are all over the place, but not clay that we can use to manufacture. And that's where, that's why there's certain regions that have clays for, for certain applications. Those are isolated. Those aren't as easy to find. Clay starts as igneous rock, which is formed when molten rock under the Earth's surface solidifies. It's not surprising the Seagrove area in the Piedmont Plateau became a haven for pottery. Millions of years ago, the area was geologically active. Molten rock was close to the surface. Over millions of years, nature broke down that igneous bedrock of the Piedmont region into a fine-grained soil. And because of the gentle slope of the land, the soil weathered and settled where it was. Uh, in, in, the, in the Piedmont, North Carolina, you can find a lot of clays in, down in valleys and things like that. That's called primary clay. It's fairly pure. All of a sudden, we see a change here down. We see a change within this, but we see a distinct change here. Um, that would lead us to believe this was laid down in some type of water, probably. And nature filtered out the heavier stuff, the sandier stuff, settled. The, the pure clay is right here at the top of the seam. Mm -hmm. So that would be good clay, I would think, to use? Um, okay, that's the, first, that's the first thing we look at. We can tell that it's very plastic, yeah. as opposed to the clay that's down here. It's, can... it's, it's not as pliable at the bottom as what it is at the top. Say, I can mold this just squeezing at it, this. It's, 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 it's chalky. It's crumbly in your hand. Right. 
The soil is changed physically and chemically during the weathering. The new soil is tightly packed and it contains the feldspar group of minerals, which include sodium, calcium, alumina, and silica. That rocky recipe, when mixed with water in certain proportions, is the perfect mix for pottery. We look for the first thing is workability. We know that we're looking for a clay that's very sticky. Very sticky is good. You can always make clays less sticky, but the more sticky that you have it, uh, and the term would be plasticity, the more plastic it is, the better it is because you can always work backwards. It's very hard to make it more plastic and more sticky. So the best clay deposits are the ones that are very sticky. Okay. Uh, the second thing you look at is at what temperature does it solidify enough that it becomes a functional piece of ceramic. And that can be anywhere from 1900 degrees Fahrenheit to 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. And we'll call that the maturing temperature. The third thing would be what color does it look like at that maturing temperature? Because if we're trying to make something that's light colored, we don't want it to be red or brown or, or, or dark colored. The fourth thing is what are the contaminants that might be in that, that might yield it to be uh, impractical to use for brick or for pottery. The silica hardens the clay in firing. The alumina slows the firing process just enough to prevent cracking and breaking. Minerals added to the primary clay influence color, strength, and heat tolerance. I'm now about 20 miles south of that first location. Millions of years ago, I would have been standing under water. As proof of that, Look behind me, the clay, the white rock that is clay now, was volcanic ash that slowly settled to the bottom of the body of water, and it settled in layers. You can see those layers pretty easily in that piece of material right there. So this clay is, uh, has a much less iron content, even though some of it may look stained with a kind of a carbon aspect. When you try fire it for the first time, it will uh, turn out a kind of a, a white or off-white color. So very low iron content and we can add that to the local clays that we find in the Seagrove area and it gives a little more of a backbone, a little more of a strength to the clay. It can withstand some of the temperatures that would go up to up to in excess of 23 to 2400 degrees Fahrenheit and just adding only 15 10, 15 percent to the body, that makes a big difference in, in making a successful piece of pottery. Well, we can make something fresh and, and continue with that tradition of using materials here in the area. That's what's most gratifying for me.